My name is Kevin Hoyt. I'm an evangelist with Adobe. Uh, my focus is on emerging technologies, which is kind of a cool job to have. I get to think about um, all these different kind of things that are coming onto the market. Uh, more recently, this is uh, things like 3D printing, um, kind of the maker movement in general. And then I get to think about how those intersect with Adobe's design products and tooling. So it's kind of the intersection of uh, technology and design. Uh, and I just get to kind of explore that space, and then I get to go to conferences and talk about all the cool stuff I've encountered and things I've uh, been able to build using these technologies and how they might uh, help you accomplish some mission that uh, you have in life. So uh, that's who I am and, uh, and what I do for a living. Um, if you want to contact me afterwards for any kind of, you know, where are your slides or what did you say about this, uh, then uh, you can go ahead and uh, reach me at K.R. Hoyt on Twitter. That's the most efficient way to do it. Uh, so and I'll, I'll put that slide up again at the end. I have a lot of material to get through, so I'm just going to kind of move pretty rapidly here. Uh, I'm going to start with this guy. This is Adam Smith. He's kind of considered the father of economics. Um, and as part of his uh, Wealth of Nations dissertation, he had a, uh, an idea called commoditization. Uh, the idea in economics of commoditization is that uh, it, it's a commodity is something that doesn't really matter where you get it. Uh, for example, uh, if, you get, if, you, if you're growing grain, grain is considered a commodity. It doesn't really matter what field it comes from or even really what part of the world it comes from, uh, unless you're looking for a specific flavor or something like that. But by and large, grain is grain is grain, and you can get it wherever you want. Uh, that commoditization comes with the side effect of cost is minimalized uh, because it's so readily accessible and can come from pretty much anywhere, the demand for it uh, is far less than the overall supply. So cost becomes uh, a nominal factor. Another example of this, uh, I use grain, but another one is like chicken. I, uh, unless maybe you're McDonald's and you're making McNugget, uh, <laughs> really doesn't matter where you get your chicken from. A chicken is a chicken is a chicken. Um, so uh, and that, that's another example of commoditization. And we think about that generally in terms of agrarian societies. But uh, more recently, commoditization has hit something called, has hit the uh, electronic space. So the guy on the screen here is an RGB LED. Uh, it's red. Uh, this is a nice, big, thick one, very similar to the one I have here that I'll be using for my demonstration purposes today. It doesn't look like much right now because it's not lit up, but it will be. And you'll see, what that, uh, you'll see that little red light pop on. Um, the LED, originally, a light-emitting diode, was introduced in 1968, and it cost about 200 bucks per unit, and it came in red, and that was it. And you think about the number of LEDs you see around the world today, um, usually, like, for example, in light bulbs, or in displays, or uh, your alarm clock, or what have you, you think about the number of LEDs you see, split, see today, you can think about how clearly those aren't $200 each anymore. It doesn't really matter where you get an LED these days. In fact, you can get it online uh, for like 50 cents. And that's commoditization. It's become so readily available. Uh, what we call diffusion of, of intellectual property has become so readily available that you can get it wherever you want. Uh, and so there's so much supply that the demand uh, is, is relatively uh, shallow in comparison. Cost is minimal. So I want to kind of open up this kind of uh, work, this flow through physical connected web uh, by giving you some key points uh, that are happening in the market today. And then we'll talk about specifics of how to actually make this physically connected web. So when I talk about commoditization and diffusion of intellectual property and, and, and how that applies to the electronics, really what I'm just saying is that overall cost of hardware is rapidly decreasing. Okay, it seems like a fairly uh, excuse me, something that kind of goes without saying, but again, keep in mind that this is 200 bucks, not but 40 years ago. Big difference now. So while costs are decreasing, pretty much everything else is exploding around this space. For example, this is a integrated circuit programmer board. It, uh, the idea is you see these little slots on the top. You take your little uh, computer chip, you put it into the slots, lock it down, and then you feed it a program, you feed this box a program, and it puts that program on all those different chips. This is still used today, um, especially in mass production, where you have to produce more than one unit, right, hundreds of units or what have you. They use something very similar to this, where they'll put a bunch of chips into these little sockets, they'll run the program, it'll burn all the chips, and then you'll be uh, off to the races with your program and all those different ports. 
It used to be, however, that this is what you needed to actually get started. If you wanted to program anything in the hardware world, you needed this little, uh, this type of integrated circuit controller. And, uh, and that seems like, okay, well, you go get out and get one of these. As it turns out, these guys run about $3,000 a piece. So this isn't really accessible technology. It makes it very difficult to, start, to get started with electronics. The other side effect of this is that generally it's built for a specific type of integrated circuit, one proprietary to the vendor that makes the box. Um, and so that creates a tight, a tight coupling, which uh, from a market perspective, decreases their incentive to lower the price. However, we'll be talking a little bit about this today. This is an Arduino Uno, very close up and just the board itself. What happened is that open source principles that we think about in software terms were applied to hardware. So you, say, you know what, let's open source the schematics for the board. Let's open source the firmware for the board. Uh, all the parts and pieces you can pick up almost entirely at Radio Shack. You can build your own. Um, you, you, this is a nice printed circuit board that everything's laid out on. But I built these things on cardboard, just punching holes with a needle through cardboard and then kind of running wire between the different points. So you can build your own for like 12 bucks. Uh, it's all open source, which means there's a huge community around it, and that has really fostered the, the kind of advent of being able to easily, for everybody, to easily approach physical computing. The Arduino Uno is programmed via USB, and we'll see that in a little bit as well. Uh, in terms of um, availability of the hardware, in terms of getting the chips and being able to program the chips is one thing, and the other thing is in terms of the hardware itself, the things you want to connect to it, motors, gears, sensors, uh, solenoids, relays, whatever it is you want to connect to it, uh, that used to be really hard to get. You go down to Radio Shack and they might have the piece, right? but uh, these days you can go online and you can buy uh, vast piles of anything you want very easily, very quickly. This is uh, Nathan Seidel from SparkFun. SparkFun is a great online retailer. If you're looking for any of these electronics after the, uh, after the presentation, sparkfun.com. Um, and as an example, you can go to sparkfun.com, you can buy certain parts and pieces, you know, maybe you want 10 of this or 20 of that, uh, but if you really want, if you're really going for, for a big scale, right, you're like, oh, I need 3,000 of those uh, red LEDs, Kevin, well, you can go to think places like Mouser, uh, various other resources online, and you can buy thousands and thousands of them at a very cheap discount, because at that volume, the, the price goes down even further. So something like this is... You know, 50 cents from SparkFun bought in the quantities of 3,000 is like 10 cents. So it starts really uh, changing the dynamics. And that's really incredible to me, the fact that you can go online and buy all this stuff very easily. So, avail so costs are decreasing. Availability and access to this stuff is increasing. The capability of this stuff is increasing as well. Um, Max uh, is our annual developer conference. Uh, in 2007, I was going. To, I wanted to drive to Max, and I wanted to report over GPS in real time where I was. I also thought it would be cool to have a webcam out the front of the window on my drive to, to our big conference, so people could see, you know, where I'm going, who's in front of me, and we get cut off by traffic and things like that. So I put together this rig on the way. This is a GPS chip, very much like the GPS chip you'll find in your phone, because I needed to know where I was on the road. In order to interface the GPS chip to my computer, which is going to be processing all this data, I needed this little serial board. So this, you put the GPS chip on this, and then you can see like USB and serial ports on the side, and you can plug that into your computer. And then you can talk to your computer over serial uh, to be able to access the data coming off the GPS. So now I know where I'm at. Again, I was plugging it into my computer. It was really the workhorse, but the computer itself actually needs to be plugged in while I'm driving. I live in Denver, the conference is in LA, yeah. so that's a bit of a drive. I'm gonna need more than three hours of battery. So uh, then I have to get other pieces involved here. Now, the problem with, the, with this Mac is that the webcam is pointed, out the, pointed at, at me. And that's fine if I wanted to do like a FaceTime or something like that, but if I'm driving down the road, I want it to be looking out the window, and I'm not about to take my laptop and shove it in the window. So I needed a external webcam, plug that into a USB port. Uh, I needed wireless while I was driving because I wasn't going to be, you know, tethered to, weather, to, tethered to an Ethernet back home uh, during my, you know, 12-hour drive. So uh, I needed to uh, solve that problem. I used a little hotspot there. All of it needs power plugged into the AC uh, uh, port on the uh, car, and I was able then to produce. Uh, an application looks like this. Anybody in the browser then could go and watch me drive, see where I was at, what was looking out the window, what my speed indicator was. They could actually chat back and forth with one another. I wasn't chatting. Uh, I was driving. But 
um, they had a very robust application for, for, the, for them to be able to, uh, to experience the same thing I was experiencing on my way to our big developer conference. Cool. All those parts and pieces put together, one year later, is that. <laughs> right, so this is when I say the capability of these things is increasing. This is the type of stuff I'm talking about. In just a year's time, I was able to take the iPhone, shove it in my window, and go. Wow, that's a big difference. I mean, think about it. It's got the battery. It's got the GPS. It's got it's got the cell connectivity, wireless, if you will. Right? It has the webcam. So it has all of that stuff packed into that little tiny form factor, uh, which is really just amazing amounts of progression in such a short short period of time. Connectivity is also increasing. Connectivity comes in all kinds of different forms. When we think about like our phones, we think of like you know I can't get a signal from AT and T. But connectivity from an electronic standpoint comes in all kinds of different forms and shapes and for factors. This is the uh, same kind of GSM. This is a GSM board uh, that's built for an Arduino. It snaps on to the Arduino, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But uh, And it provides you GSM. You put a SIM card in the slot there on the top, and you have a GPS capable uh, or a GSM capable thing, uh, device. And uh, there's libraries for it. So sending a text message is like three lines of code. It will pop onto the network, send a text message, you're good to go. Um, so you can do you can do cell phone connectivity if you want to do that from your electronics. This is a wireless board, uh, so if you want to do true like Wi-Fi, ABGN type stuff, uh, then you can go ahead and uh, get one of those guys. Uh, if you want to do something like Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth is becoming uh, really com common these days because of Bluetooth 4 and its low energy profile. Its smart profile doesn't require any kind of sophisticated pairing anymore. It just automatically knows about each other. So Bluetooth is another great way to do uh, communication and connectivity. Uh, this is XB. The problem with the, the problem with the Wi-Fi, like an ABGM Wi-Fi and a, uh, a Bluetooth, are that they're very kind of local. This is XB. This guy will broadcast up to five miles away. All right. So if you want to monitor, like in my neighborhood, um, and I don't know if this is legal. I didn't ask, but um, I put up a uh, monitoring station for the. Uh, temperature of our pool, uh, the community pool, which is about a mile away, I put I put it in the pool, and then at home I could see the temperature of the water and see if it was a nice day to go swimming. Um, so something like that is uh, is a, is one way to go. Um, this is uh, this is a 433 megahertz band uh, transceiver. 433 megahertz band is something like if you have a weather station at home, or a weather sensor, you might buy it from Oregon Scientific or something like that. They broadcast on this channel. So if you want to leverage existing infrastructures that are already there for you to use, you can use something like that. And then, you know, where would the fun be if we couldn't uh, uh, have infrared? This is a little infrared transceiver. If you want to be able to go to a bar and turn the channel of the TV without them knowing, this is a great sensor to have. Um, always lots of uh, fun and hijinks to be done with IR. So. The point here is that you have a decrease in cost, an increase in connectivity, an increase in capability, and, which we'll talk a little bit about later, desktop fabrication, which means a huge opportunity for you as developers, both for you as an individual developer, but also for you as, a, as, a, as uh, for the companies you work for. There's lots of opportunity because you put all these different things together, and we're kind of at this really unique moment in time to be able to capitalize on all this stuff. So how do you get started? Lots of opportunity. That's great. How do I get started? Well, the common way these days is usually with the Arduino Uno. As I mentioned, it's open source. Uh, you can buy these at Radio Shack for like 20 bucks. You can get them online for even cheaper. Uh, it's a little tiny board, 16 megahertz processor. Um, it's uh, got a bunch of these little rail, these little pins, uh, rails on the side that hold, allow you to plug and play things. So you don't need to know about soldering or anything like that. You just plug pins into the right places and plug them into something else, and voila, you can make magic happen. Um, and it really is that uh, freeing, actually, that liberating. Um, the Arduino Uno, you can buy them online. They come in all kinds of different sh shapes and sizes. This is the most common one currently. Uh, but they come in ones that are twice as long. Uh, they come in ones that are as big as my thumbnail. Uh, they have all kinds of different form factors if you want to get them. But they're all programmed with the same technique and the same te approach. Uh, and so I'll show you that here, actually, next. So we've got our, uh, our Arduino, which is really a little computer, if you will. It doesn't have an operating system that we would be thinking of normal computers like a Macintosh or a Linux or something like that. Um, but uh, uh, there's our little computer. Uh, this is the LED that we talked about earlier. And you'll notice on the LED there's a long leg and a short leg at the bottom. So the, the long leg is called the anode. It's where electricity goes in 
And the short leg is where it's called the cathode, it's where electricity comes out. Uh, so just like you have a, a light bulb when you screw it in, right, it's got those two touch points of, of metal, the one on the bottom and one on the side where you've screwed it in. Same thing happens here, uh, just as a different form factor. And so I'm going to take this uh, LED and I'm going to plug it into to a couple different rails, uh, holes on these different rails here inside of my Arduino. And then I'm going to go ahead and program it. Now you program it with, as I mentioned, over USB. So none of those, no $3,000 chip programmer to, do, to make this happen. Now this is a little USB cable. And this is USB A. Uh, you, if you want USB mini or USB micro, uh, they make Arduinos in those form factors as well. But the most common one is USB A. So go ahead and plug that guy in. And I'm going to hook him up to my computer here as well. Because again, we're going to program him via USB. Now, the Arduino environment is like this. Uh, it's free as well. It's open source as well. You can download it. It's not a Visual Studio. It's not an Eclipse. It's not a whatever IDE you're used to. Uh, this is like, you know, there's, there's no breakpoints. There's no, hey, let's next and step over things. There's none of the memory, like memory inspection or anything like that. No. This is largely a glorified editor, but it has all the libraries built into it. By the way, if you want to use other IDEs, there's support for that as well. Uh, again, open source and community really changes the, the dynamics involved here. Uh, but this little program uh, says has two methods. One's called setup, and that's how every Arduino program starts. And uh, we tell it, in this case, that pin 13 on this guy is going to be an output. So we're going to be able to send voltage to pin 13. And then we come into this next function that's a little bit further down, and that's called loop. And this seems kind of crazy from, if you think about uh, modern kind of programming in the browser or what have you. We don't want to have an infinite loop. But that's exactly what we have on the Arduino is an infinite loop. That's actually what we want. We want it to monitor those port ports and control the voltages as fast as it can. Always. Forever. Right? That's what we want it to do. So the loop function gets called next. And then it says, hey, turn on pin 13. And then it says, wait a second. And then it says, turn off pin 13. And then it says, wait a second. And then it loops. So the end result then is a blinky LED. This is the first program that everybody writes when they do Arduino. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. We'll start up the Arduino tool. Go to File, Examples, Basics, Blink. Hey, where'd you go? There it is. And I'll go ahead and send this over to the uh, Arduino sitting here. So it's going to compile it. It's uh, effectively C. Uh, but it's going to compile it, and then it's going to blink. Bing, 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 bing. Yes! We made a blinking LED. <laughs> that doesn't seem like much to start with, but realistically, that's, all, that's kind of a lot of the fundamentals of what you need to do, know to do other things. Like, um, well, I'll show you some other examples. So that's the, basically the fundamentals of what you need to do. Now, I want to actually change this up a little bit. Um, I want to connect this to the web. Again, this is about physically connected web. So now that we understand the physical part, let's talk about the web part. Uh, I have a handy-dandy Arduino program here that, ex that I, I won't explain in, in its entirety, uh, but it effectively it sets up and it has the same kind of commands, but it says, hey, on, uh, on the USB port, listen, have the computer listen for any data coming across the serial port. And then as the data comes across, it's going to give this little serial dot available, and, um, and it will say, oh, read the characters and do something with the character data that's coming across and make something happen on the computer. So we have access to the serial port. Well, that's fantastic. Let's go ahead and upload that guy then. So now he's sitting up there happily uh, waiting for something to come across the USB port. Well, as it turns, as it turns out, there's a lot of different ways you can talk to the serial port. Kind of in the web world today, the most common problem would be Node.js. So I have a little node script here. I'll go ahead and start it. And it attaches to the serial port and is now waiting for, for, waiting for data over HTTP to come into that little node server. And when it does, it's going to send whatever data it gets right on over to the serial port to the Arduino. So then let's go ahead and open up the web page. Ooh, fancy. All right, so there's our web page. It's sitting there. It's waiting there. I push the button. The light comes on. I let off the button. The light goes on. Okay. All right, so what's happening there is that the page is, is actually opening up a web socket to node. Uh, when I push the button, it sends a one or a zero across, which I on or off. 
Uh, sends a 1 or a 0 across that web socket, node gets that data, passes it on over the serial port to the Arduino, the Arduino sees a 1 or a 0, and sets the pin either on or off based on that 1 or 0. Now we're connected to the web. So we made some pretty good progress. We've been seated for uh, about 20, 22 minutes, and you've already, now you're connecting things to the web. All right. Uh, this is a, I like to kind of throw a few, a few examples out there, kind of a few practical applications along the way. This is one of uh, my personal favorites. Um, I've been showing this for years, and, and I've yet to run into the guy, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, have you ever seen Harry Potter? There's a scene in Harry Potter where Harry is at Ron's house, okay? And, Ron, and he looks at the wall, and instead of seeing what time it is, he sees a clock that shows where the members of the family are. So the arrows on the clock, they point... To, uh, to different conditions. So this guy uh, thought that was a pretty cool idea. He made his own to do exactly that. Uh, so he was able then to tell, uh, to via his phone, to tell the Arduino, hey, set, you know, little Timmy to this. And so then it would take that, it would spin little Timmy's needle around to show where he's at. Hopefully it never ends up on mortal peril. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but that, I thought that was a really cool uh, connected uh, example of it. He has a, he has a kind of a really cool build out of it. You can see the clock there, and he, and he talks about how he did it and uh, what the electronics are inside and everything like that. Uh, he calls it the magic clock. Um, so you get the idea. So there's some really neat things you can do now that you can turn on and off electronics and talk to them remotely. Oops. So... Uh, what about this Internet of Things thing? Uh, because, I mean, having Node talk to a WebSocket, talk to Serial, talk to the Arduino, that's pretty cool stuff in its own right. It's a lot of moving pieces and there are ways to simplify it, but that's the functionality of how it always pretty much goes when you're working over Serial. problem is that if I want to build a, a monitor for the pool in my neighborhood, I don't want to have to put my laptop next to the pool. Like, that's no good. Because this is like this. This tether is really this is this is a bit of an issue for us. Um, so talking over serial is cool and fun. You can kind of get the hang of how it works, and that's great. But it's not really the internet. It's not really out there. It's not on wireless. Not anybody can access it. Not anybody can program it and make it do things. So I want to take this a little further. Uh, a great example of the Internet of Things. This is one that most people are familiar with. But um, this is a, an old thermostat. Uh, I find myself dating myself because uh, I find a lot of people that don't know what this is. Uh, but this is a thermostat. The idea behind this uh, classic thermostat is that you would uh, turn the knob and the uh, little plastic clear knob on the inside and set it to a certain temperature, and then your house would be that temperature, just like the kind of digital ones we have today. Um, the interesting thing about this particularly, though, is that it's, it's, it operates off of a principle called bimetallic. Effectively, what they've done is they've taken two pieces of metal, different, different types of metal, and different types of metal have different chemical characteristics. So you've got these two different pieces of metal, and one is going to uh, change, like, uh, like most metals well, is going to change its length. Uh, it's going to try to expand or, de or, uh, or contract based on the a ambient temperature. So as it does that, these two guys are fastened. As it contracts or expands, it pulls the other one with it or pushes the other one with it, depending on, how the, depending on the temperature. And eventually, what happens is there's a wire that comes into the back of the two pieces of metal. The temperature in the room changes. It changes the curve of the pieces of metal. It touches another wire on the other side of the thermostat, and voila, you, your, your AC kicks on, or your heating kicks on. Really, really basic. Like, you would think that's a really sophisticated piece of equipment that runs your HVAC system, but really it's just two pieces of metal that happen to change at different uh, temperatures. Modernized, it looks something like this. This is the Nest controller. Uh, right, this is a nice, high-quality digital sensor in it. Uh, it's connected to your wireless. It has a nice, cool uh, uh, display on it. You can uh, you can just turn the knob and say, "Oh, I want it to be this temperature when I leave, um, or this temperature right now." And it learns from that, it reports all that data to the cloud. It learns from that. Uh, it can then adapt for you and change the temperature in your house for you. Uh, you can pick up your phone or your browser and change the temperature from work at, at, at your home. Uh, so this is a, a kind of classic piece of technology in the, in the form of a thermostat that's really come online as a, as a kind of a really great example of Internet of Things and the different things you might do with that. That wireless bit is kind of the tricky bit, though, and it actually still is the uh, tricky bit when it comes to the Internet of Things. Uh, 
uh, current, more like one of my current favorite ones to do this with, is called an electric imp. So, uh, that is an electric imp. You see it on the screen there, that's the actual size. It's an SD card. At least it looks like an SD card. It's actually a full computer inside there. It's a full ARM processor, memory, Wi-Fi stack, uh, all baked into that little tiny card form factor, which is great because then you can easily plug it into existing SD card sockets. What comes out the other side of the socket in terms of what's connected to it doesn't really matter. And so in this case, they, they tie the uh, different outputs of the SD card into various pin inputs, very similar to the pins we were using on the Arduino, just uh, these are the other way. So now when we connect this, it will then go ahead and turn on the pins and turn off the pins for us. Now, let me go ahead and snap a couple pieces together. We use a little breadboard here to keep things so I don't have to solder, but it would take me a lot of time to solder everything here for you. So I use a little breadboard, lets me snap pieces together. I'm going to go ahead and wire this uh, LED right in here. I've got the LED, and I've got a couple little wires here. Take a little, this guy's going to actually activate pin 9. So we'll take pin 9. And we'll go ahead and put him in there. And then it's got to go back to the ground. So I'm going to take it out of ground. And I plug it into ground on the board. Put it in there. there we go. All right, so now I have this little wireless module. It's got a computer on it. Uh, it's got it's hooked up to the, uh, the breadboard. It's got the LED wired in. It's all good to go for the most part. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. There's my LED. The code for this guy, actually, the fun thing about this guy is you actually develop for this guy entirely online. Uh, it's, an, it's an in the browser editor, so you don't have to worry about downloading anything. You can edit this stuff wherever you want. This is what a program looks like. It's actually written in Squirrel. Uh, Squirrel is a, kind of a JavaScript C hybrid kind of thing. Uh, it's not a very hard language to learn. If you're familiar with JavaScript, you'll pick it right up. The idea here is that we're going to configure this, LED, this, uh, this imp, this electric imp, uh, as a remote LED. You're just putting a name on it. We're going to configure pin 9 to be digital output, and then we're going to write to digital output, send it to zero, just turn it off. Now, something is eventually going to come in from the internet and call set LED, and it's going to pass it a value. So we're going to pass the set LED, and in this case, it's going to log that out to the server so we can see it in our debugging console. But then it's going to say hardware pin write LED state. So if it gets zero, it's going to turn it off, and if it gets a one, it's going to turn it on. It's exactly what we were doing on the Arduino and with Node, but now we're going to do it over the internet in a kind of a cloud environment. This last bit is actually the important part. It's agent on LED. So there's this notion called, this is all the program for the hardware itself, but then there's the other part, which is the connectivity from the internet to the hardware, and that's called an agent. So the agent here says, uh, on LEDs, it's a vent listener, right? So on LED, when I get this LED command, go ahead and set this LED, go, go ahead and call set LED. And that's the function we just saw. So that's the program on the hardware this is kind of the, the incoming HTTP handler, so request handler, request response. See if it has this value parameter in it, uh, and make sure it's either a one or a zero. We don't want anybody just passing random stuff to our uh, electronics. So we'll go ahead and say, uh, if it's a one or a zero, it's there. We'll go ahead and set the value um, to the value that came across, and then we'll say device.send. So send to my imp, send to my little uh, computer here, that value. And that's where we get that list, event listener on the other side to go ahead and pick up that value and, uh, and go ahead and handle it. And then we'll go ahead and send data back if we want to make sure that people can see that. And if we take this guy. Now I'm still going to use a cable. In this case, I'm going to use a cable because I need electricity. And I left my battery adapter at home. So I will connect this guy via electricity on uh, my USB port. And that's all this is for. Uh, I have. Uh, so just so you're aware, we're talking about getting rid of the cable as part of the problem. The communication is happening wirelessly. The, um, in fact, there's a switch on, on the board here. You actually can give it, a, give it a battery cell, and it will last, depending on what you're doing with that battery cell, it will last months and months and months on that battery cell. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty robust little piece of uh, hardware. Plug it in. Oh, wrong side. So it's, uh, it's, you can see it's blinking green. That means it's actually connected to the uh, wireless. So it's connected to the wireless. And then I can go ahead and say, hey, turn it on. So it gets a URL. I can say, hey, turn it on. But da it's on. So there's two. Now turn it off. 
Ta-da, turn it off. Okay, so I imagine at some point you might have played with uh, PHP or Python or C Sharp or whatever it is that you prefer as a language on the server, and you probably made some URL calls to some API somewhere. This is exactly what that's doing, and in fact, it just lets you uh, change, every change everything up. If I wanted to actually take this and make it a little more pretty, just because I like things to look better, I work for Adobe, so pretty is kind of important. Um, I'll go ahead and turn, I have a nice little switch here, and I can say, oh, turn on, yeah, it turns on, and turn off, yeah, it turns off. So there we go. Now we're connected to the internet. And this is, again, this is truly connected to the internet. It's open on the internet. If you went, um, I want to disconnect it here in a minute, so if you're trying to enter this URL, uh, good luck. But, um, but, uh, but uh, that's the URL. If anybody on their mobile phone went to that URL and put value equals one, it would turn on. So you get the idea, okay? It's uh, not that hard to go and connect uh, things to the wireless, to wireless and, and have the internet at your disposal as well. Talked about the switch. Uh, another practical example for you, kind of practical, about as practical perhaps as the mortal peril clock. Um, but uh, Budweiser uses this electric imp platform for one of their products in Canada. This is a real life size hockey light that makes real life size hockey sounds and real life size hockey light up. Um, and uh, the idea is that you as a consumer, you buy this. Uh, you attach it to maybe your TV or your ceiling or whatever the case may be. Uh, and then you go onto the Budweiser website, you tell them what your favorite teams are. And when your favorite team scores, as they score, this thing lights up and makes lots of noise. And you can all celebrate uh, as though you were there in the arena. Uh, so that's an example of an Internet of Things. And it's really valuable, of course, to Budweiser because they get to know all kinds of interesting demographics about their consumer now, right? Uh, so the Internet of Things is, again, an opportunity not only for you, but also for your businesses. Other things going on in this space. So I mentioned that uh, we have uh, decreased costs, we have increased capability, increased uh, connectivity, and we have decreased, um, I mean, we have a desktop fabrication. So desktop fabrication is the other piece I want to mention here briefly. Uh, this is a 3D printer. That's a MakerBot specifically. Um, the idea here is that... Um, it's about, this, this one's about like this size. Uh, the idea here is that it has a, a head on it that moves in two dimensions, and it can effectively lay down thin layers of plastic on top of one another in any uh, combination, and eventually it builds up enough plastic to take on a shape. The actual entire green thing you see in there has actually been printed on the MakerBot. That's actually, it's usually an empty cavity uh, where you build stuff. That actually has been entirely built entirely uh, out of plastic on demand based from a 3D file. So 3D printing is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, a lot of really interesting things you can do with it. Um, and I think we've really just kind of started to see where this can go. I've read all kinds of crazy stuff like, oh, I want to have a case. For example, you can print kind of flexible plastic, you know, a custom case for your iPhone with your name on it, right, and your style. Uh, obviously, all, all, it's kind of frivolous, all the way to like the really practical, like, oh, I, uh, uh, I have... Uh, I had lung disease, and so I, the, the doctors printed a lung stem that matched my uh, part, my physiology exactly. Wow, like that's mind-blowing stuff. Um, maybe on a macroeconomic scale, printing houses. Uh, that is also being explored. So all kinds of interesting things come from 3D printing. I did some 3D printing just to test it out, so we could, uh, how we could apply our technologies to it. And uh, that's what this actually is. So I have the imp uh, that I showed you earlier. He's inside there. Uh, I actually customized the slot for it. So there's the card itself. And uh, he's sitting in there. And uh, so there's the Adobe logo, which I obviously wanted to have as an Adobe employee. Uh, so I'll go ahead and give him some power. So now he sits on the uh, network. And let's go ahead. I'll go back to this, this plastic switch example. We'll say on, hey on, okay. So now I can have a little USB uh, Adobe lamp. I actually took this one step further. I put a uh, RGB LED in there. It's a red, green, and blue LED mixed together. And uh, that means you can control the various brightness of each one. If you can mix red, green, and blue, what do you get? Lots of different colors. So, for example, if I wanted to turn it blue, turn it blue, if I wanted to turn it... Uh, like a nice pink, maybe. Uh, green. Green kind of comes out more yellowy in the real world. I need like a darker green to make it more green. 
Right, so you get the idea, right? I can control now from the internet. I can control this. In fact, I actually built a nightlight for my daughter that does exactly this. She breaks out her iPod. She goes to a web page that looks like an icon on her, on her screen. Presses the icon, launches a web page. She can select a color from it, and now her color of her nightlight matches her mood, um, which is actually pretty helpful. Um, so, uh, so, th so there we go. So that's, uh, that's 3D printing. Uh, and again, where that can go and what people will do with it, who knows. Um, another example that I'm really excited about is actually laser cutting. I know laser cutting has been around for a while now, but I find it really compelling because it's so quick and so affordable. Something along this size is about $110 to print. Uh, so to do something with a laser, though, is about a dollar a minute, and the material is much, much cheaper. Uh, a sheet like this is like eight bucks. Um, so you can start doing things with laser cutting, and you can actually use, if you're familiar with uh, Illustrator or any other kind of vector tools, you can actually drive uh, a laser to cut and assemble things. One of the things I've been recently teaching in some of my workshops that I do in conferences, uh, this is what I call the indicatenator, uh, because I like giving you some verb. Um, and the idea behind the indicatenator is that uh, you want to know what the traffic is as you're walking out the door. So in this case, the indicator has a Raspberry Pi on the back. It checks the, the uh, traffic in your area and then it, every five minutes, and then it updates the LED to match the appropriate traffic conditions in your area. You know how your commute's going to be. I have another faceplate for it that actually does the same thing, but for weather. Again, with my daughter as an inspiration, I wanted to be able to... She, she would, you know, I live in Denver, and she would uh, pick a, a set of clothes and go outside in December and be like, oh, I'm going to play ball. No, it's, there's six inches of snow on the ground. You can't dress in shorts, sweetie. Um, so we would, so we, I mean, we, this always gets kind of got on our nerves. And so I built a, a weather version of this that has weather icons. And then I use an RGB LED inside each weather icon to say whether or not it's hot or cold, right? So it could be sunshiny, right? But it could be really cold. So it would be a blue sun. And then she knows, oh, I got to put on a jacket today. Resolves that problem. All right, so, uh, so that's, a, that's an example, but all done with laser cutting. Um, the entire sheet, all the laser cut and everything is 20 bucks all put together. So uh, you can really, laser cutting is a really interesting way to kind of go with it as well. And then there's the good old fashioned um, X-Acto knife, right? And cardboard and things like that. Uh, this, is exactly, this is what I did here is I took a QR code, I blew it up to about two feet by two, well, two and a half feet by two and a half feet. And then I divided it off into one inch squares and a grid. And then I took the QR code, uh, and then I took a piece of foam core board, I divided it off into one half inch squares. And then I started uh, figuring out which ones were colored in on the QR code and then mapped those to the piece of foam core board. I cut out all the different parts and pieces and uh, then was able to construct a box, put them back together. And the end result then looks like something like this. This is actually in my basement in Denver. And, uh, oh, this is not going to come on today. Come on, network, go, go, go. There it is. So that's in my basement in Denver. I'll go ahead and turn it to red. I click on the red thumbtack. It'll send that over to that, and it'll turn red. But yeah, we're talking about the Internet of Things, right? Like, I, like well, that's, for me, that's just a decorative uh, item that I have in my man cave. The QR code, by the way, comes up, goes to a page lets me change the color. Um, so... Um, so I could go, I, anybody can come, go down to the basement, can scan the QR code, and pick a color, and change the ambient light in the room for the movie we're going to watch that night. Um, and that was kind of the idea for it. All done was just foam core board, exacto knife, glue, an Arduino is in there, and we're off to the races. So everything I've shown you is actually just what I've used to build this. 3D printing is really cool. Laser cutting is really cool. Sometimes just an exacto knife and some glue will do just fine. So with that being said. I uh, erase my, I move out my slides. That's actually, with that being said, that is actually my last slide. I'll go ahead and put my Twitter up there if you want to do, uh, if you want to contact me later, ask any questions about how I did any of this stuff or any tips, that's fine. And as it turns out, we have just a couple minutes for a couple questions as well. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Um, for that Budweiser thing, how did they, like how do they handle the blink up part of uh, the, the amp where like to get it on the Wi-Fi network? So yeah, so the AMP is interesting in the, the way that it, one of the challenges, and this is still an ongoing challenge with uh, wireless, is, that, is how do you tell a device what wireless network it's on? Where's your screen? What are you going to, how are you, are you gonna, this isn't an iPhone, this isn't your tablet, you're not going to 
there's no wireless icon here, right? So how do I tell this thing what, the, what network it's on? So they came up with an ingenious way. There's a little photo cell, uh, photoreceptor in the back here. And when it's powered on, you can hold it up against your phone and it blinks a certain rate, just like Morse code, and sends it over to the chip. And the chip then knows what network it's on and what the SSID is. They do the same thing in the Budweiser lamp. You put it in the Budweiser lamp, you put your phone up against it, and it blinks the message out to the, uh, the SSID and password uh, out to the uh, board. The, uh, the problem with that is that some phones, most notably Android phones, actually don't have direct control over the refresh rate of the screen. As you might imagine, if you're off, off sequence, it's going to change how it impacts the, uh, the chip. And so there are other interesting new chips coming to market. Uh, you might check out something like the Spark Core. Spark Core actually uses a sub-protocol on, on top of the wireless network to actually communicate two devices on the wireless network. So for example, your computer knows what networks are there. So there's clearly some communication happening already. And so Texas Instruments goes the next step and actually lets you use that communication channel to tell a piece of hardware what the wireless SSID and password is. So there's some interesting new technologies coming out to around that. It is still very much a challenge to actually set that and uh, be able to do it easily. You usually have to bake it in, yes. Um. Do you have any input or thoughts on the Tensile board that's coming out with the JavaScript uh, engine on it? Yeah, yeah, I think that's very interesting. I am a backer myself. I'm looking forward to getting one. Um, uh, yeah, the, the idea, so we've come to a point now where this stuff is so approachable and all open source, we get to the point where we're like, well, do I really need to know C to program it? Like, if I know JavaScript and everybody else knows JavaScript, why don't we go ahead and use JavaScript? And, and uh, the Tensile board is exactly that. Let's just program the chips using languages that we probably already know. Um, in terms of additional functionality, it may or may not have. You know, like I don't have one yet, so I can't explore it. Uh, but I would suspect it would be very similar to what you've seen with the Arduino or the Amp or anything else. Really, again, electronics boils down to digital in, digital out, analog in, analog out. That's pretty much the four things you need to master. And the language you use on top of that can be anything. And for the Tesla, it will be JavaScript. Yes? Uh, back to the intellectual property implications. Over the last 30 years, the copyright industry is like motion pictures and music and so forth have seen huge uh, impact from the personal computer. Um, now the patent industries are likely to start getting nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, so, I see, uh, I see two different, uh, to, so far, I think this, this exploration of this space is still new, and so we'll see the, the long-term implications. Um, I see two different approaches. So something like the Budweiser environment, goes with an electric amp, like the, the actual firmware for the electric amp and the way you program it is all proprietary, the blink up is proprietary and patented, right, so it gives you a bunch of additions be, uh, for being proprietary, it's still very very inexpensive on the whole, the chip is like uh, 12 bucks, uh, the, the mounting board that I use is like another 12, 20 bucks, so uh, it's still relatively inexpensive, but, uh, but otherwise it went entire, entirely proprietary to that aspect. Sometimes that comes with certain values. Um, the other side of the maker space, the maker environment, is very much a, uh, I did this, here's how, which is fantastic. Um, for example, the magic clock that I showed you, the Harry Potter inspired clock, like that, he opened, he, he puts it out there, he puts the circuits out there, he puts out how he did it, uh, and that is a really big benefit for, uh, for ma future makers moving forward. Where we'll end up with that, I don't you know, I really don't know. Any other questions? Fantastic. All right. Well, I will be around uh, for the rest of the conference, and of course, after the session, feel free to ask me any more questions you have them. At KROI on Twitter. Thank you very much. <laughs>